The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube. Well, we've had a fairly quiet start to the week for the weather here across much of the U.S. Sounds like, though, that could change as we go through midweek and towards the weekend. We want to talk about what we're looking at in the latest forecast model runs and more. Joining us now for our weekly weather update here on the show, Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions is with us. Eric, thanks for joining us again this week. Good to catch up with you and, uh, Looking at the weather here, I think a lot of folks have been happy with the start of the week, but sounds like things could change somewhat drastically in parts of the country as we go through the rest of our week here this week. So get us up to speed. What are some things you're following here over the next few days? Well, any of the changes we talk about in the forecast are really going to be uh, have to be taken under the lens of where the moisture has not been, right? So we got some decent rains last week in the eastern Corn Belt, in the Mid-South, flooding in the south and heavy rains up the east coast. But coming out of the Canadian Prairie, where there is still some snow, into the northern plains, and then that pocket of the central plains from Texas to Oklahoma and parts of Kansas, Nebraska, that's a hole that needs filling in. So the pattern that's about to evolve is one we call an omega, right? So it looks like the Greek letter omega, and which means we have two troughs on like south of a big ridge. Now, a lot of times we like that pattern because it slows everything down and it slows stuff down. You sometimes can get these lows spinning up in places that really need the moisture. Uh, but where we need that moisture is in those holes I just mentioned. And right now, because of the way the trough comes in, it starts off in the northwest, goes to Colorado tomorrow and Thursday and even a little bit into Friday and then goes to Arizona. So it doesn't go east, right? It comes back into the south. That's going to prevent one of these lows from ejecting into the plains, giving us a good shot at getting some moisture back into like the hard red winter wheat belt. Uh, but east, where we are, um, we got increasing chances of severe weather as we progress toward the end of the week. I think the 14th is going to be a day where We'll watch for the risk of storms that could stretch from maybe eastern Texas all the way up through Illinois. So we'll have to keep an eye out on that. Uh, overall, though, the pattern is wetter the farther east you go, wetter the farther south you go, and wetter if you or snowier if you stay in the mountains. And there's the possibility along the front range there in uh, Colorado that they may get some spots that are between one and two feet of snow, uh, all dependent on the elevation, the upslope behavior of this. But we're not able to fill in some of those holes just yet that I want to see filled in. So I would call this a bit of a, a transition time period. You know, we had been in February and through early March really stuck in a pretty regular routine pattern. This is where things are going to start to mix up a bit as we get more daylight hours. We work toward uh, the equinox and start to maybe see a true spring pattern begin to emerge. Well, and thinking about that Omega pattern you're mentioning, what about temperatures with this? I've heard some chatter that maybe a little bit cooler weather in the back half of the month here. So well, what's the latest on the temperature front with all of this, Eric? Yeah, and that's an interesting story that we tried to follow close over the weekend. And what I mean by that is that we thought that the end of March was going to be on the cooler side. Even the first week of April, I thought was going to be on the cooler side. But this is what's kind of changed, okay? Uh, still very warm today and tomorrow and even a little bit into Friday for much of the Midwest, upper Midwest, Midwest 20 to 30 degrees above average, very, very mild. That's all the setup for the severe weather late this week, but it turns off quite cold west first. I'm talking about the Western Plains, not the whole west of the United States, but the Western Plains. And then by Sunday, because the Omega pattern doesn't let the trough come out, our cold air doesn't come from the West or North. Actually, it's going to come from Hudson Bay and, 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 and the Great Lakes. And it's going to sneak in from that direction and drop temperatures off in a pretty big way, maybe bring in some snow showers late this weekend and early next week for the kind of the Great Lakes states and surrounding areas. How long does that cold air last? That's the question. That's what changed. Because by the time we get out there to the third week of March, there's a chance that instead of having the colder air all focused east while the west goes over warm, we could leave it right in central Canada. And if that happens and we put that cold air in central Canada, 
the third and fourth week of March is gonna have a sharp divide where the Canadian Prairie, the Northern Plains are very cold. And Texas is like in the eighties and nineties. And right in the middle, if that sets up that way, right in the middle, it will be very, very, it'll be wild, right? It'll be the end of March with multiple storm systems, severe weather risk, snow north, rain south. It'll be like what we typically can get in March. Now, that's just what kind of, that's the hints that are showing up in the models. I can't tell you if I'm set on it yet. If I see two or three more days of forecast where that temperature pattern is quite cold north, warm south, then yeah, we're in for it. Windy, stormy, snowy on the backsides, and, and very, very wet, I think, for the midsection of the United States. We need it, be honest with you, but uh, we'll have to watch it. Yeah, we will definitely have to watch it. We'll see how it evolves here over the next few days for sure. All right, Eric, uh, I know some new long range models out for summer, not to really look too far ahead, but at least we can kind of peruse through the models a little bit and maybe start to form up some ideas in our head what summer could look like. So what's some of the latest you're seeing with some of those long range models right now? Yeah, so let's uh, let's do April real quick, and then let's go ahead and talk about summer. Uh, April for the April forecast, I'm gonna have to rely quite a bit on analogs. I do think we see warmer conditions uh, mid to late April. I think it's gonna be open planting windows for the Midwest. If it's cooler anywhere, I think it's gonna be a little cooler than average across the South uh, and wetter across the South. But I see some decent planting windows for us. I gotta be honest, a lot of my friends and colleagues that chase storms still. I used to do that before I had a different career. Um, you know, I think they're pretty excited about the Midwest. West. I think they're excited about the plains for severe weather season, which mostly comes into uh, the month of May. But if we get into summer, here's the big idea. El Nino is slowly fading. Some cooler water finally emerged. The North Pacific Ocean temperatures are just as important to watch as the equatorial Pacific Ocean temperatures. And remember, it's along the equator that we have our El Nino event. I think El Nino's speed at which it collapses will help determine those North Pacific temperatures. And here's the two thoughts, okay? Right now, if you choose the European model as your forecasting model, it's driest in the Western Plains and the Four Corners states. And that stretches up and down the whole plains of the United States. It's wetter if you get east of the 95th meridian, like the whole rest of the country, it has wetter. If you choose the National Multimodel Ensemble, which is another suite of models we have, then take the dryness out of Mexico into the Southwest in early summer, bleed it into the Western Corn Belt by midsummer, I'm talking July, and then the entirety of the Corn Belt, Mid-South, I mean, the whole central United States, it's got under very dry conditions by the middle and end of summer. So the Multimodel Ensemble, that one is the one that absolutely destroys El Nino, pulls it into a full La Nina by summer. European does it slower. So you say, well, which one's doing better lately? Uh, they both kind of have the same skill scores. They do. And what needs to happen is we got to get past what we call the spring barrier, get into a uh, spring pattern to see which model actually predicted the demise of El Nino correctly. Then we can get a little more close as to what we think the summer could be. But I'll just say this, from me personally, I have a bit more anxiety about this, not anxiety. I have a bit more concern about this season for the Corn Belt than I have had in the past. Uh, I think it sits a bit on a knife's edge right now and it could tumble one way or the other pretty quickly. I am a bit worried it goes over to the drier side given the lack of good soil moisture recovery this winter for the majority of the Corn Belt. So if spring doesn't do it, then summer is gonna be just uh, a setup for just in time rains. And sometimes it makes for good yields and sometimes you miss big areas with it. So that's what I know. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, South America, I've heard some chatter. Things are getting a little warmer down there. So let's wrap it up with a look at South America's weather. What's the latest you're seeing, Eric? Yeah, it is. It's getting quite warm for their late summer time period across some major growing areas with that safrina crop. And long story short is this. The models trended again drier over the weekend for the center west. They keep far southern Brazil, parts of Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina very wet. And the models don't want to let that pattern go. If they're right, that means we'll have a, a pretty strong case to build that the safrina crop will be hit, I think, with a bit of a yield loss if this dryness continues through the rest of March into early April. Any other final thoughts for us this week? Any other weather uh, phenomenons you're watching around the world, Eric? I think I've done enough of a brain dump on you this morning, Jesse. We'll just <laughs> we'll cut it off right there, and and we'll just uh, we'll keep watching the pattern evolve as we uh, talk next week. 
All right, fair enough. Well, I know folks can find more information, ag-wx.com, ag-wx.com. With that, Eric Snodgrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions. Always great to chat with you, my friend. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, you bet.